of your spirit. But we choose to invite it at another level today. Take us where we've never been. Show us what we've never seen. That we might give more of Jesus away to a deficit world. Thank you for quickening us to hear your voice, even as we hear this message today. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Before we uh, get into our text today, uh, I'd like to read to you a, uh, well, actually, first let me tell you a testimony. How many believe in divine coincidence? That's an oxymoron. I don't mean the person near you. Uh, uh, it's a contradiction of terms. There's no such thing as a divine coincidence. Uh, but you knew that before we went on holiday, uh, we were in this situ situation where we'd been given notice to get out of this building, that it, uh, they have planning permission to turn it into flats and townhouses and business fronts. And so uh, I'm on holiday, as I told you before, kind of minding my own business. And uh, we happened to visit my mother's foster cousin, probably in real terms, no real relationship blood-wise, but uh, somebody that I've known for many years. And anyway, went to their house, and they're believers, lovely people. Just before I'm to leave, we're out in front of his house, and he starts telling me a story. Now, he doesn't know our circumstances. But he starts telling me how they got their house. They have a lovely home. And I had to chuckle. You want me to tell you the story? Yeah. yeah. Well, I want to tell you the story because it's relevant. I just want to make sure. He said they, they, had, they sold their house and they bought another house that wasn't too far from the one they sold. And uh, the moving trucks came on the day that they had to be out of their house, and they put all their stuff in the moving vans. As the moving vans were driving down the road, the estate agent got a call. This is in America, so this happens there. Got a call saying that the house they thought they had bought had fallen through. Now listen to me now. They couldn't go back. All their stuff was in the vans and, and the other people were getting there to move in. And they couldn't go forward. Now what does that sound like? Ah. Could it be relevant to, to us? <laughs> when you can't go back, Israel could not go back and they couldn't go forward. So they were at a Red Sea situation. Put yourself in their shoes. You just moved out of your house. All of your stuff's all been packed up. It's in the moving vans. And the house that you, you bought, you thought, says, no, no, you can't come in here. Effectively, you could be on the street. But the estate agent who happened to be a believer, said, no, no, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not taking this. Remember what I told you that the first step of faith is? Say no. Some of you were listening. You have to say no to what doesn't belong to you. She said, no, I'm not taking this. Then a thought entered her mind. Let's say that. A thought entered her mind. You know, in your crisis moment, God wants to put a thought in your mind that is the doorway to your miracle. Did you get that? In your crisis moment, God wants to put a thought in your mind that is the doorway to your miracle. 
Here was the thought that came into her mind. From a human point of view, a crazy thought. A crazy thought. Remember I said to you last week, the life of faith is not like the life of earth. Hello? Here was the thought that came into her mind. There's a house right down the street here. Go knock on the door. Now, I don't think that's the way estate agents get business. <laughs> but that's earth. Are you with me? She went and knocked on the door of, of a house that she just had this impression she should knock on the door. And a woman answered the door, and she said, excuse me, she said, I, I, I'm a state agent. American terms are real estate. She said, would your house be for sale? And the woman just stared at her in unbelief. She said, we hadn't told anybody, but we were listing it tomorrow. She said, well, I have your buyer right down the street. How soon could you move out? They only had to put their stuff in storage for a very short period of time, and they moved into a beautiful home. We're moving house. Hello. Amen. Yes. And God is not scratching his head. He is not scratching his head. God has given us a place. We will move into it. I'd like to read to you a prophetic word that my spiritual father just passed not long ago gave to this house and just a portion of it. He said, this is a crossroads of the world. This was the word of the Lord. And I will raise you up and take you on a journey. Even now, says the Lord, I stir deep within this house. I stir the community. I stir by the wind of the Spirit a hunger in the hearts of the people who are sitting in gross darkness, and they will see a light that shines out of this house. Do not be discouraged. Do not let the circumstances crowd you in a corner. I have something in mind that's beyond your thinking process. Do not limit the Holy One of Israel. Do not put borders on what I can do. Do not say thus far and no more, God, but say, Lord, here I am. Speak the word and I will obey. For I will take you on a journey that will take you into the impossibilities. I will take you places that you know that without me you can do nothing. But do not fear when you come into these places. Do not let your guard down, says the Lord. Hold high the shield of faith, and all those darts will be quenched. For good seasons are destined upon my people. This is not a day of gloom and sadness. This is a day when joy will fill my house, and those that know not the Lord will say, What causes joy in the dark day like this? And you will say, It's the Lord's doing, and not men, and it's marvelous in our eyes. For I will take you through places that will surprise and then your enemies and the critics will say, truly, the Lord is with them. God gives us prophetic words. So as Paul wrote to Timothy, you can war a good warfare by those prophetic words. So I want us to, to continue our examination of this subject of faith because this is a faith journey that we're on. Not only as a congregation, but every one of us. Your life in Christ is a faith journey. It's a faith walk. For the just shall live by intellect. No. Because some of us might be ahead of others. I remember my oldest brother came home one time when and uh, this is when they were doing IQ tests. I don't know if they ever did it in, 
in the UK. But uh, anyway, they were doing IQ tests, and he came home and he proudly told my dad, he, he was, I think, 17 at the time, he proudly told my dad that he had a very high IQ. And he just wanted my dad to know that, basically, dad, you should be listening to me. <laughs> I mean, they tested me. <laughs> my dad listened to him, and he said what the number was. And he is a very intelligent man. My dad listened to him and just said, son, it doesn't matter how much IQ you have, if it doesn't help you to make your bed, it's not worth a whole lot. <laughs> he kind of put it in perspective. But uh, I was going somewhere with that story. Anyway, the just shall live by faith. We live by faith. We walk by faith. It's a faith journey. You get introduced to a whole new way of living. And here in, in Acts 27, uh, when they're in their crisis, God speaks through a dream to Paul. And in verse 25, he encourages everybody who looks like they, they could lose their lives. He says, so keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. My faith is strong because I've heard from the Lord. My faith is strong because I've heard from the Lord. Now, you know, Ephesians 2 and verse 6 is, uh, I find, a very challenging verse. It's a very encouraging verse, but it's, it's a very challenging verse as well. It says, And by God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in Christ Jesus, in his kindness in, to us in Christ Jesus. So what is that really saying? Uh, one translation says that God has lavished his grace on us. He lavished his grace on us. And what I find challenging about this is that I have to look at my life and say, does my life look like God has lavished his grace on me? I mean, does, does God tell a lie? Absolutely not. So you have to look at your life and say, God says he lavished his grace on me. Does my life look like that? If it doesn't quite look like that, you want to look at how it's going to look that way. Romans, Romans chapter 5. Romans 5, in verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You got put right with God through your faith. And he says, through Jesus, we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. So God says the doorway to grace, the lavishing of grace, the access into grace is faith. So the only way my life will ever look like it's been lavished with God's favor and God's help and God's blessing and God's health and God's increase and God's fruitfulness and God's joy. The only way my life will ever look like that is by faith. I don't want to stand before Jesus and say, you know, I know you paid an incredible price 
for my life to be a revelation of how much you love me and how much you love all of mankind. But I only used a tiny bit of it. I didn't really grow my faith so that I looked like somebody who came from heaven instead of somebody who came from earth. And so it's, it's vital for us to get the message of faith and live the life of faith and intertwine and interweave everything in our entire journey with this message of faith. And so I want to read one more time the paragraph you have on page two in your notes so we can really get this stamped deeply into us about how significant this message is. Because every day of your life is a faith day. There will be some, something that arises that connects, that involves faith. It says, before you had faith, you had nothing, even if you had a high intellect. You lived in darkness with no way out. You were as vulnerable and weak as you could possibly be. Your health was subject to change any moment with some attack. You had no protection. You had no remedy. Your work life was subject to all the oppressions of the Egyptian system. You were cheated, robbed, and betrayed and had no remedy. You were weak in yourself and you doubted your future, your worth, other people's love for you, and your own ability to succeed. When trouble came, you only had the world's resources to deal with it. If the world had no lasting solution, you simply suffered through it or died. Trouble, tragedy, and disaster could eat its way into your inner man, and all you could do was cry, complain, hurt, blame, and be angry, even if you only did it inside yourself. You watched the ones you loved suffer as well, with only human words to comfort them. You had no power to change their mourning into dancing. You were powerless, hopeless, weak, defiled, beyond cleansing, and sentenced to die while living. Life was trying to make crumbs into substance and make any positive emotion last longer than a few seconds. And I remember a, a woman who came and her, her life was in a terrible, terrible crisis. She was extremely wealthy. Her, she and her husband together were multimillionaires. And the crisis in her life was that her husband had decided to divorce her and marry a much younger woman. She did not know Christ as her Savior. But she poured out her story and her heartbreak. You think about it, she was probably 60. She was looking forward to her latter years alone. Whatever she had assimilated in the, the journey of life that she thought might have been of value was now reduced to zero. Oh, she would still get a significant financial settlement. And she told me what the settlement was. Probably 25 or 30 times your current salary. A house in the London market probably worth about eight or ten million. A brand new Mercedes every six months. So in terms of natural things, she was going to be well taken care of. But in this season of her life, she said to me something I'll never forget. 
She said, Pastor, I would give all that up in a moment for 15 minutes of peace. She was engaging a very important life lesson. What is most valuable in life? It's not the stuff out here. It's the stuff in here. It's your life in here. And, you know, when you live in the world and you don't know Jesus, it's all the stuff out here that you think makes a difference. If I have it, or if I don't have it, or I'm going to get it, or I lose it, my life is based upon all the stuff out here rather than in here. And so it's, it's vital for us to grasp the message of faith as the new way of living. When faith came, when you heard the word of God concerning salvation and you recognize that this wasn't just an idea that was floating even though you may have heard it many times before but now in this particular moment you thought this is God speaking to me this is God saying and I choose to believe this that God's calling me into his family and that I want to be in his family and so I, I choose to believe that there was Jesus, a man called Jesus Christ who is the son of God who died on Calvary's cross I choose to believe that and I choose to believe that I'll do what he said he said if I'll confess my sins. He is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins. I choose to believe that. I choose to believe it. And so you did it. And when you did it, because you believed it was God calling you, there was a transaction. There was a transaction because faith is a transaction. It's a transaction. If you're going to get something at the store, there has to be a transaction. When you go to the bank of heaven, there has to be a transaction. There has to be something you offer, and then there's something that comes back. When you go to the store, you put some money down, and you can take your goods away. When you go to the bank of heaven, you put your faith down, and you carry away what the Bible says is righteousness, peace, and joy. It's a transaction. It's not just a notion or an idea or knowing a verse. It is a sense of certainty that when I believe there's a spiritual invisible transaction taking place. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews 4.16, let us come boldly to the supermarket of heaven, to the throne of grace. Let us come boldly. with full assurance of faith that we might receive. Everybody say, might receive. If you go to the store and you don't put down the money, you don't get the goods. Unless, and then the bells go off and you're in worse condition. So, faith is so important for our journeys. On page three, the spirit of faith. We talked about faith comes by hearing, and we hear a voice. You hear a voice. Whose voice do you hear? Well, you hear the Lord's voice. You hear the Spirit's voice. 2 Corinthians 4.13 calls it the spirit of faith, or the faith, or rather the, the spirit that brings faith to you when you hear his voice. So it's hearing his voice. You'll get all kind of other voices. Just as I'm sure my mother's foster cousin, when they found out that they couldn't go back and they couldn't go forward, I'm sure the other voices were crowding their minds. Where are we going to live? Where are we going to sleep tonight? You get the voices. But there is one voice that has to be higher than all other voices. All other voices. And I'm sure you found places in your journey already when the voices were crowding your mind. And maybe it's there today. The voices are crowding your mind that are the wrong voices to listen to. 
You know, you can have a radio tuner in your car and you just push the button and it finds the next station, doesn't it? You just push the button and then it's, you know, talk radio or it's BBC4 or whatever, rub, I mean, uh, station it is. Just push the button and you change the voice. If you're going to be a person of faith and live the faith journey, you got to know when it's time to change its station. You got to know when it's time to change the station. Sometimes you start off well and you're listening to maybe premier praise or whatever it is and, and in your journey, so to speak, and, and you're doing well and you're believing God and then boom, something happens. Without realizing it, if you're not careful, you hit the tuner. They go, oh no, disaster's on its way. You got to change the voice. You know what we do most often? We call Liz. Say, Liz, you know, I got some really bad news. Or we call Sean. We say, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do now. I just lost my job and I can't pay my bills and, you know. What are you doing? You're listening to the wrong station. The wrong station. If you don't change the station, you'll have whatever you have when you don't have faith. You'll have the natural evolution of circumstance with the devil's help and everything that he brings. So it's a spirit voice that we have to hear, a spirit voice. All right, moving over, let's look at Galatians chapter 3. Just so that you think I am not making this up, I want to give you some verses. Galatians chapter 3. In verse 2, the scripture says, I'd like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit? Let's just stop there. How many of you received the Spirit? The rest of you, what did you get? Come on now. Does Jesus live inside of you? By the Holy Spirit. Yes. Raise your hand. Okay, good. good. I want you to get engaged with this because this is a very simple point, but a very important one. If you know Christ as your Savior, God lives inside of you in the person of the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. 1 Corinthians six seventeen says, He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. So the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. Romans 8 says, if you don't have the Spirit, you don't belong to Christ. So you have this. So he says, did you receive the Spirit? He's talking to New Testament believers now. By observing the law, we'll just, for the sake of the discussion, the Ten Commandments. Did the Holy Spirit come and live inside of you because you, you, you really did your best to try to live according to the Ten Commandments? Anybody here? became a Christian by screwing up your teeth and trying to live the Ten Commandments? So uh, you failed, I'm telling you that already. Okay, did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by, what's that next word? Believing. believing. You received the Spirit by believing what you heard. So the law age finished and the first message of the church of Jesus Christ preached on the day of Pentecost by Peter, a masterful message where he rehearsed Israel's history. And at the close, he says, this is how you participate in the work of Christ. And his first word was repent and be baptized and be filled with the spirit. Repent. Because they heard 
not Peter's voice, but the voice of the Holy Spirit, they became believers. You receive the Spirit by believing what you heard. Now let's go a little further. Now he's, he's talking to, to the Galatian church, but he's really talking to everybody in all the ages of Christendom. He says, are you so foolish after beginning with the Spirit? How many began with the Spirit? I'm not sure, did I? No man comes to the Father except the Spirit draw him. So your life in Christ began with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit began to draw you. You came under conviction and he, he spoke the voice of God, the thoughts of God, the salvation of God to you. You heard his voice and you believed him. And as a result, as many as those who believe on him <clears throat> become the sons. You receive him as your savior by believing. After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal, <clears throat> excuse me, by human effort? In other words, you started off by getting help from heaven by believing. Your believing led to receiving. Your believing led to receiving. If you weren't believing, you weren't receiving. Some of us heard the gospel many times before we came to know Christ as our Savior. We heard the message, but we weren't believing. So we, we didn't do any receiving. He said, are after beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Have you suffered so much for nothing? Verse 5, does God give you his Spirit? How many of you have received the Spirit? Okay, I'm not talking about baptism of the Holy Spirit with speaking in tongues. Some of you may not. But... You have the indwelling Christ if you come to know Christ as your Savior. Does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you? So the scripture kind of assumes that God gives you his spirit and working miracles are tied together. Is salvation a miracle? Hello. It's the first big miracle you had. Give you his spirit and work miracles, plural. Sometimes God's people have the miracle of salvation, but that's the only miracle they see as they travel their journey. How contradictory is that? Is that you start your Christian journey with the supernatural, God does for you what you couldn't do for yourself. He comes and lives inside of you and washes away your sin, gives you a cleansed conscience, gives you a new nature, comes to live inside of you. That's a miracle. When you leave this life, like he said to the thief on the cross who confessed him as Christ the Savior, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, you leave this life and you go to be with God forever in heaven. That's a miracle. So how contradictory it is to have a miracle to start with and one to end with and very few along the way. I mean, God's kind of stingy, eh? I think not. He says he lavished his grace on us. So he says, did God give you his spirit and work miracles among you because you worked hard at it? <laughs> That's what it really says, observe the law. Or because you believe what you heard. So let's take this as our template for living. If God is going to work miracles among us, there's a connection to the Holy Spirit. That means we have to believe what we hear. We've got to believe what God says. That's the only way you get a miracle is believe what God said. Believe what God said. All right, so let's quickly move down here in your notes. The component of faith, the parts, the makeup of faith, really. First of all, we said last week, faith thinks. To be a faith person, you've got to think the thoughts of God. Three sources of thought, self, Satan, and God. Well, you can have a human thought, you know. Some of you are thinking right now, I'm, Pastor, I'm hungry. 
hurry up and finish this message. <laughs> now, that's a human thought. Maybe of the, no. That's a human thought. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with being hungry. Just postpone it for a little bit. There's a satanic thought. The thoughts of temptation. Thoughts of revenge. Often the thoughts that come into your mind when you get angry or anxious or worried. All those are satanic. You wouldn't sometimes recognize it. For years, I didn't recognize it. I was so used to thinking that I was rubbish, I thought that's who the, the real person was. I didn't think that, you know, the devil was trying to make me think I was rubbish. I just thought I was rubbish. I thought it so much, I thought that I was thinking those thoughts. And I was thinking those thoughts, or I was entertaining those thoughts. But it, there came a day when I, revelation came, I realized where those thoughts came from. Because normally, you wouldn't sabotage yourself, would you? You wouldn't wake up in the morning and say, let's see what I can do to mess up my life. Make it miserable, depressing, horrible. Let's see, let's see. See if I can make a list here. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, let's do those. Yeah, all right, here we go. You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't do that to yourself. God wouldn't do it. What's the only other source? So it's so vital to recognize where the thoughts come from. And if you're going to be a faith person, you've got to source your thought life in his thoughts. What God says about everything. Uh, that's why, as we said to you, the Christian life is a journey of adopting a new mentality. Everybody say a new mentality. mentality. Say it again, a new mentality. A new mentality. One more time, a new mentality. a new mentality. That mentality is the one that's on the wall behind me. Nothing, nothing, well, with a few exceptions, no, nothing will be impossible for you. So who's the you that the scripture is referring to? Be careful now. Who's the you the scripture is referring to? Me. me. How many believe it's me? Okay. Rest of you, okay. Now, put on your seatbelt. Is that true? Yes. Okay. Now, if next Sunday, listen to me now, if I came to the service with the lapel button and on it said, nothing is impossible for me, would you wear it? Yes. Oh, I mean, do I have to wear it in public, Pastor? Couldn't I just wear it in my bedroom, you know, or just, you know, show you? Why would you shrink from wearing it if it's the truth? You'll know the truth, and the truth will make you ashamed. Whoa. Come on, listen to me now. Don't dare me. If I brought the button next Sunday and I said, you're a faith person, that's the word of God, how many would say, well, I'll, I'll wear it? Yeah. Some, some of you are like, yeah, Pastor, I'm not, I'm not used to to thinking that way about myself. I'm not used to thinking that way about myself. You know, Pastor, you, know, you don't know, you know, I, 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 I don't read all that well. You know, and I only got a Bible 12 years ago. I haven't had Bible college. I don't have the same IQ as Kai. You know, I'm not all that. My history has not been all that glorious. 
That's why I said life is a journey of development, developing a new mentality. Now let me tell you why this is important. I read yesterday that the government of Rwanda just shut down 4,000 churches. So, what am I saying? All of us, if Christ tarries and you live, we're headed for a world where the only way you are going to survive financially, physically, spiritually, is if you walk by faith. If you walk by faith. If you don't walk by faith, you'll, you'll finish. So, let me take the vote again. If I brought a lapel button next Sunday that says, nothing is impossible for me, would you wear it out? And would you wear it to work? Well, some of you are honest. Well, no, I wouldn't wear that to work. <laughs> they might give me a promotion. I don't know if I want it. <laughs> See, that's why I say it's, it's developing a different mentality. You don't come out of the womb with this mentality. You only get it from here. Thinking the thoughts of God. So are, are you as an individual, or are we as a congregation, are we ready to accept this mentality? Well, you know, I've been comfortable with the one I've had, Pastor. Yeah, how are you doing with that? Are you lavished with grace and favor and blessing and increase so much that you're kind of delirious with joy most of the time because, whoo! Thank you. It's a new mentality. You got to think it. The only way you can start thinking is getting this this into your head, into your head, thinking it. I'll tell you about a pastor. I have mine on my phone. I've got mine on my tablet. Whether it's on your phone or your tablet, or on paper, it's got to go from there to here. You got to get in here. You got to get in here. If you don't get it in here, you won't be a faith person. Turn to your neighbor and say, God doesn't want you to be a struggler. <laughs> now tell him, God wants you to be a winner. <laughs> so faith thinks Faith thinks. That's why Joshua Wayne says, meditate and you'll prosper, you'll succeed. Secondly, faith hears. We looked a bit at that already. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every entry in Google. No, man shall not live by bread alone, and you live by bread alone. That's a, that's a reference to eating eating food, your, your daily life, your daily routine. Most of us eat every day unless we're fasting, and we're, we're not fasting all the time. So a man doesn't live just by bread. That's, that's just biological life. He says, you live from God's point of view by, the, by owning a Bible, by coming to church service. Many people think that. I go to church service. I'm a Christian. It just means you left one building and went into another. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. I got to hear. I got to hear. 
as I said to you last week, if you were the devil and you knew that God's people were going to really prosper and do amazing things when they exercise faith, what would you attack? You'd attack their hearing. You'd attack their hearing. So you, you first got to have a earring, earring exam. That's the ear and hearing. Got to have an exam. What voice do you listen to most? What's really going on inside? You know, hearing comes out of a cultivated relationship with the Holy Spirit. It's an inner faith-producing work that comes in your devotional life. You learn to listen to hear. You know, uh, I've said this before, but I, I grew up in a large family and there were eight children. And so, uh, you know, eight children is if you're a parent or been a parent, uh, managing eight children is a major management process. Sometimes, looking around today, managing one's a process. My mother managed eight. But I'll never forget one of the things she said often. She'd be speaking to me and she'd say, now are you listening to me? Well, of course I was listening. There was noise coming out of her mouth and into my ears. And that's what she was concerned about. There was just some noise coming out of her mouth and going up to my ears. What she was really saying wasn't, have you had some audible discernment of noise? What she was really saying, have you heard me? I want you to get this. And there's a reward that comes if you don't. Some of you would know what I mean. So, hearing comes out of a cultivated relationship with the Holy Spirit. You get up in the morning, you say, Lord, you know how to live this day. Tell me. Speak to me. You know what I'm going to face today. So when I have my time with you, and it's just you and me in the book, tell me from what I'm reading what's important maybe for the moment, but maybe something I'm going to need for later in the day. You start training your ear to hear. One of the ways you can train your ear to hear is by praying in tongues. Because praying in tongues, as the Bible says, increases your faith. Jude verse 20. How does it do that? It gives you the ability to discern the voice of God. To distinguish it from other voices. So, Faith thinks, faith hears, and faith sees. Faith sees. If you're going to be a person of faith, you have to look differently than you did before. Your life before you came to know Christ was based on your five senses, primarily on what you saw with your eyes. So your emotional scale went up or down based primarily upon what you saw with your eyes and what you heard with your ears. When they told our family that my mother was dying and there was no hope for her, and I, we saw her every day lying in the bed, impossible to move or get up, what we saw and what we heard determined our reality. And all eight of the children lived with that reality. I'll never forget as a boy, 
I came home from school every day and hung out with the other children on the front porch. Not because this wasn't our house, because none of us had the courage to go inside and find our mom dead. That's what we heard. We heard the doctor. And that's what we saw with our eyes. Our mother, always so strong, so vibrant, so full of life and blessing and wisdom, so capable, now reduced to nothing. Thank God there was somebody in the house who didn't see that. And that was my dad. He said, you know, what I see with these eyes and what I hear with these ears in a natural world is not what I see in this book. And now what I hear the voice of the Holy Spirit saying to me. That was one of the toughest prolonged journeys of my childhood seeing my mother like this for several months and every day thinking I'm going to attend my mother's funeral. That was, that, was, that was a pretty strong thought. And then, you know what, I, my dad got the idea we should move house. Remember what I told you? The faith walk is not, everybody say not. not. It's not the walk, the same kind of walk you have outside of Christ. Logic doesn't say if your wife is dying and near death that you move house with eight, ki eight children 3,000 miles away. That's not logic. That's not sense. Somebody say, well, you know, you, 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 need, to, you need to use wisdom here. You know, you, you, your wife could die on the way. And, you know, what about your job and, and employment and, and the schooling and, and all of those things? And, and so all those voices feed in. And then what you see with your eyes kind of confirm it. Oh, that's not a really smart, 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 highly intelligent idea. My dad heard from heaven. You're going to move 3,000 miles. And the story gets even tougher. And where are you going to go? Where are you going to live when you get 3,000 miles? We did. All the kids pitched in, and the older ones helped the younger ones. And Loaded everything up and gave stuff away. Piled it into a trailer and hooked it to a small sort of minivan type thing that probably was worth less than the car you're driving. Much less. And we drove 3,000 miles. Took quite a few days because we stopped along the way. To kind of camp out by the side of the road, mom lying in the van near death. We moved 3,000 miles. We stopped at my grandparents on my mother's side till my dad could get a job and find a, a, a place to live. We hadn't, he hadn't gotten a job yet. He hadn't found a place to live. We'd only been there a few weeks, and he heard about a prayer meeting. Lots of prayer meetings. He thought, I never, I don't know these people. Well, we're going to go to the prayer meeting. Just he and mom. So he picked her up. Say, Pastor, that's really stupid. That doesn't make sense. He picked her up, stuck her in the car, semi-conscious, took her to the meeting, sat in the meeting. And I tell this story in India because 
the man who was the speaker at this prayer meeting was an Indian evangelist who had been a Hindu, gloriously saved, and God was using him. And my parents didn't know him from anybody. The meeting comes to a conclusion, and he says, oh, he says, there's a woman here suffering heart trouble. If she'll come to the front, I'll pray, and God will heal her. As my mother tells the story, she, she tried to, but she couldn't. She couldn't move. And so before my dad could take her to the front, the man says, if she doesn't come, I'm going to call her name. My dad picked her up, took her to the front, held on to her while this Indian evangelist just prayed the simplest little prayer in the power of Jesus' name. My dad stuck her back in the car, took her home, put her in bed. The next morning, she got out of bed herself, and she's been motoring ever since. She's coming up 95. <laughs> I think she was about 39 at the time, 40. What am I, why did I tell you the story? Because as children, our reality was what we saw with these eyes and what we had heard with our ears. But for my dad, he said, no, no. There is something higher. For my ways and my thoughts are not your They're higher as the heavens. When you take his thoughts, you start subscribing to heaven because there's heaven in his thoughts. When you don't have heaven in your earthly circumstance, you got to go to, to get it. And this is the first place, the first port of call right here. Say, you want a good reason to read your Bible? You need more of heaven. Need more of heaven. Need more of heaven. Faith sees. You know, uh, I won't have time to really develop this one. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to it, but let's put it in the Old Testament context. In the Old Testament, God did awesome things. Why? Because he wanted his people to know he was God and he was powerful. So he did all these amazing miracles. Amazing miracles. Then in the New Testament, he wrapped them all up in Jesus. And he did it so he, he could say to his people, I now am not just in heaven doing all these amazing sovereign things. All of us know the scripture. Nothing is impossible for God. In the last days, it's this one that will come into the fore. Because where is God in the earth? Hello. In his body. That's why you move from the Old Testament to the New Testament when you see nothing shall be impossible you so in the Old Testament God displayed himself the New Testament he wants to display himself through his body he wants us to see so he, what do you do he says okay how am I going to teach Israel faith all right what I have to do is I got to give them a different picture everybody say a different picture so many times in life you need a different picture Come on. I mean, we live in an image-obsessed world. Some people can be even looking images while I'm preaching. <laughs> we live in an image. It's, why? Because image is so powerful, isn't it? So powerful. If I said to you, fried chicken, 
immediately in your mind you can you can get a picture can't you it's 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 nicely browned and steam coming off of it and the aromas coming out of it and and, and you know you you start you start working with that picture pretty soon you you could say okay I'm off to KFC now pastor sorry your message wasn't finished the power of image you have to have a different picture so God says okay I want, I want to teach my people faith so what I'm gonna do is I got to change the picture what have they been looking at for 430 years what are they looking at bricks straw Egyptians the welts on their back whatever it was that wasn't good that's what they've been staring at God says I got to give you a different picture so he says I got a better place for you I'm, I'm not gonna tell you anything about it I just no he says, I gotta teach you something so he says I like you to get a bunch of men called spies they're gonna go spy out the promised land what are they supposed to do they're supposed to sneak in to this promised land this geography that is absolutely amazing and it was God's hope that these 12 guys would come back and say whoa whoo, whoo, what we have seen in fact we wish Kodak was born now only two guys came back and said Woo! what we've seen what we've seen what we've seen he, he, just, he was he's working on one of their faculties what they see with natural eyes God says I want you to see what I see you're living here in Egypt but I'm looking at where you really belong I'm looking at your new address I'm looking at your new address not where you've been living but your new address where are you living what's your new address what are you looking at and you know how compelling it is because when they first ran into trouble what did they what came out of their mouths what came out of their mouth was what they were looking at. It's impossible to go. Why did you ever take us out of, out of Egypt? Why did you, Moses, why did you ever bother? If Moses had been retaliatory, he could have said, well, you guys weren't really happy there. You cried out to God to get you out. God says you got to see it different you got to see it if you're gonna go there you got to see it different you have to see it different and I'll close with this he does this corporately he says I got a place for you in fact by the way you're out of here and you're going into another place a better place that's where you belong it's not a lease it's an own and he does it personally he does it with every single one of us he went to a guy named Gideon he said hey Gideon mighty warrior Gideon said who are you talking to mini warrior if, if anything God says Gideon I see you differently than you see yourself if you don't adopt the way I see you you'll never be what I say you are you have to agree with me and my view of you oh the pastor you know what's happened to me you know you know the Philistines have beat me up you know and they you know they killed my dad and my mother and my sister and you know this happened and, you know <laughs> no I'm no mighty warrior I'm a wimp did God change his mind no no God says Gideon you're a mighty warrior and if you'll say yes to me you'll become what I see you want to become what he sees you got to start saying yes to what he sees you got to see differently well I may 
I guess if God says I'm a mighty warrior, I, I, I guess, I, guess I, I could be. I, 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 I could be that because God, he made me and, and, he, and he loves me and he'll help me. And it's not on my own or my own strength or my own intellect. Well, well yes, God. Yes, God. I embrace that. I embrace that. You, you say one day you want me to preach the gospel in a foreign land and, and go to London. Okay, okay, I'll do it, God. I'll do it. It's not my history. It's not the way I've been thinking. But yes, yes, I, I, I see it. I see it. I see myself going to a, a big city where many thousands of millions of people don't know Jesus. And I'll go there and I'll, I'll raise the bloodstained banner and do what you call me to do because you said I could. That's how you see. I will go with how you see. I'll see what you see. God has an assignment for you based upon what he sees. Stand to your feet. If you only look at yourself based on human eyes and not the promises of God, I believe you'll live sincerely, but you won't expand to become the person God says, that's the one I see. We're so used to allowing the limitations. You know the limitations. Pastor, you have to understand the limitations. The limitations are lies. God says, I see something a whole lot bigger, more fruitful, more blessed, more prosperous, healthier, stronger, greater, more significant, influential. That's how, that's how I see you. Do, you. do you see what I see, God says? Do you see what I see? Or do you say, well, you know, I am 60 some odd or 70 some odd. I like coming here. You know, I can't really. No. Here's what it says. God is not a man that he should lie. Here's what it says. Is it the truth? Is it the truth? Is it the truth? Pastor, I can barely afford rent. What do you mean, buy a house? Buy a house. One word from heaven. One word from heaven. Mixed with faith changes everything. Let's pray. Bow your hearts with me. Father, we thank you for this amazing, wonderful journey that we embarked on the day we gave our lives to you. We put them in good hands. And you're not only our Savior, but you're our teacher, the great master teacher who teaches us how to live. Lord, you said we would hear a voice behind us saying, this is the way. Walk ye in it. Thank you, Lord, for that voice, the voice of your spirit the voice of faith, the voice that brings the miraculous just as it did in our salvation. It brings the miraculous to our circumstance. We say no to what doesn't belong. We say yes to you. We say, Lord, what's your point of view about that? Okay, that's my point of view. What do you see, Lord? That's how I see it. What do you think, Lord? That's how I think. I'm a person of faith. I'll walk by faith. I'll grow and increase in my faith that the glory of God, as is evidenced in John chapter 2, will bring many disciples to know Jesus because I walk by faith. And I walk in a company of people who walk by faith. Father, this is our prayer. We ask in faith. We believe that as we stand at the throne of grace today, we receive that grace afresh to walk as faith people in every circumstance of life.
And all of God's people said, 